Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? 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 Jeff Eggers is the executive director of the McChrystal Group Leadership Institute, where he leads research on organizational performance and leadership. He is the co-author of Leaders, Myth and Reality, a 2018 Wall Street Journal bestseller. Jeff was formerly a special assistant to the president for national security affairs with six years of White House experience, principally in foreign policy, counterterrorism, South Asia, and the war in Afghanistan. He retired from the U.S. Navy in 2013 after serving over 20 years as a combat veteran Navy SEAL. Jeff's operational tours included several SEAL teams, commander of the Special Operations Task Unit in Western Iraq, and operations officer and mission commander for the U.S. Navy's Undersea Special Operations Command. This episode dives deep on leadership, developing your ability to overcome challenges, and how Jeff pushes himself. Hey guys, it's Sean, and I have a very exciting announcement for you. In a few weeks, there will be some other people behind this microphone guest hosting the show. They will be the brothers behind Key2 Super Coffee. For the longtime listeners, you guys are familiar with them. The DeSicos actually were on episode 53. You guys can submit your questions to them and actually win some incredible prizes, both from Super Coffee and also MCT Bar. If you guys want to submit your questions, feel free to shoot us an email, info at whatgotyouthere.com. Or you can tweet at us, hit us up on Instagram, What Got You There podcast, or at Drink Super Co. I'm very excited for these guys to grab the microphone. So if you have questions, please send them in and get a chance to win some awesome prizes. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand They're MCT Co., and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. So I need to know right off the bat, sitting here having a coffee loaded with MCT oils, (laughs) I I wanna know. It's not just MCT oil, by the way. So then what else is in it? Well, the other supplements are not as healthy. It's actually got sugar-free vanilla syrup in it as well. Um, somewhere along the way, I I discovered that you could put those things in your coffee. You you didn't need to be a purist about your coffee, and it's been hard to go back to black coffee. Um, so it's got MCT oil and sugar-free vanilla syrup, and that's oh. that's the that's the morning ritual now. So a little flavor will never hurt. I'm interested though. People who do that put that much thought into their their coffee. How important is health, nutrition overall for you in your life? It's extremely important. I mean, the, the only thing we have uh, is to, to, you know, as a first primary resource is our time on this earth. And what you can do with that time and how much time you have all comes back to your health and your nutrition. Um, you know, how, how alert you are, how creative you are, how energetic you are, how productive you are, all comes down to what you're doing to your body and what you're putting into your body. And so I think it matters, Very right? Um, it, it, it factors into your relationship, uh, relationships, it factors into your professional productivity, uh, it factors into your longevity your state of mind, your happiness, and everything. So uh, for me, the question is, is almost why wouldn't you invest in that? You mentioned the importance of, of health, relationships, overall well-being, longevity. When you're thinking about how you structure your day, your, your fitness, your nutrition, what are you thinking about categorically there? I start the day with the workout only because I know how 
real people think and work through the day and real people, it gets squeezed out. You make excuses. And the only way I can guarantee it's going to happen is if I do it first. Otherwise, I'm a victim of my own fallibility and temptations and laziness and so forth, and it doesn't happen. It needs to happen. After that, it's mostly about my schedule and routine because, again, the only way to safeguard against falling into traps of temptation and so forth, I think, is to, is to structure around um, some discipline in terms of routine and schedule. So literally scheduling meals you're going to eat versus meals you're going to skip because I do um, play with intermittent fasting and I can't keep track of it. So I just schedule it and I look at my schedule and see where it makes sense to skip meals. And then everything down to scheduling when things are going to happen through the day so that I don't end up not going to bed by 10 o'clock because the only thing more important after exercise and nutrition uh, is sleep hygiene. And that comes down to your schedule because if you're not being efficient with your day, you can't get more sleep because the first place you go to get more time when you're not efficient with your schedule is your sleep. And that's, that's just um, stealing from yourself. Anyway, so those are, those are some of the ways I approach it. But I'm not that good at it, to be honest with you. I could learn a lot from people who are really good at it, and I'm still trying to. So then in the morning, you mentioned you have to get that workout in. What does that look like, even, even timelines? When are you getting up? How soon after are you getting into that workout? Well, we have a dog. So <laughs> you, you, if you're a dog owner, you understand that the, the morning ritual often starts with the dog. So what I'm doing now is... My wife and I will, will try to take turns, but if it's, I'm on a running day, I will start the run with the dog, do a mile with the dog, drop the dog back off at the house, and then do like another four without the dog. The dog can only do about a mile. It's a little dog. Um, and then every other day, I'll do something like yoga or something that's more strength-based. And that will vary depending on where I am in the seasonal cycle, what I've got coming up on the calendar in terms of uh, endurance or, or, uh, competitive type events, you know, sometimes it's more based around taking my daughter to the rock gym. Cause she's got me back into rock climbing. And that's a great, great, great form of exercise, both for your body and your mind. So it really depends on where I am, but I basically go with some sort of cardio strength based rotation, try to keep it at six days a week. You mentioned rock climbing. I have to ask, have you seen the documentary with Alex Honnold? Of course, yeah, it's Free Solo is an amazing film. And I say that it's not just an amazing story, and it's an amazing story, and it's, it's about three or four amazing stories all woven into one narrative, but it's an amazing film. Like the, the, just the, the, the cinematography and the way it was produced and edited makes for an incredible film, even before you get to the fact that the subject matter itself is just mind-boggling, which it is. Yeah, Jimmy Chin did that, and he does some unbelievable work with his cinematography. I'm also interested about the rest of your day, and your very routine in the morning. Does that continue throughout every element of your day? What I'm trying to figure out is how do you find that, that time and that space for creative work and free thinking throughout that day when you can have meeting after meeting or so many things on your priority list? I schedule it. I, I try to schedule almost every hour of my day and I try to schedule about half of it to be unscheduled. So I will schedule time to read or write or do research. And that way it doesn't get squeezed out. Because you're right, if, if you don't do that, then your calendar gets filled up with meetings. And so I, I literally schedule everything down to filing my expense reports or my time card for the week, as we do in a consulting firm, or things like there are four articles that I need to read to be current in my space. I'm going to block off two hours. The next two hours I have open, I'm blocking that off to just do reading. After that, it becomes a matter of thinking about when you're in better shape to be doing this type of task versus that type of task. So for instance, reading, writing, or expense reports are very different cognitive loads. Mm -hmm. And I think our ability to perform for those tasks varies through the day in your routine. And so you want to align those blocks with the part of your day that's optimized for that. 
Um, and for everyone, it's different, whether it's you know, morning or evening or whatever. But that, that's, I think, the next level of refinement that really gets to enhancing productivity now. I'm thinking about that next level of refinement. Is that something that you've self-assessed or have you read other research that has led you to those thoughts? Both, both. I've experimented with enough that I can see patterns of where I find better ideas, where I have better insights. And after a while, you, you pick up on those patterns. You know, the, for me, one of the most recurring and predictable is exercise. And, and it's to the point where I had to learn how to transcribe ideas while running because if I waited to the end of the run, I would often have lost the idea, right? A half an hour, 45 minutes later, it's not there anymore. So I will literally run with my phone and transcribe thoughts as they come to me during the run so that I still have them at the end. And then, then I can do something with them. Because while you're running, what are you, you know, what are you going to do with that idea? Have you figured out a method for when you're swimming? Because <laughs> that is when I, I get my not. ideas. I have not. But to be honest with you, I don't do uh, that much regular, extensive swimming at the moment. Mostly, that's for my kids. I, I watch my kids swim now more than I swim. What about some of these other creative moments? You you mentioned running. Any other peaks or valleys during the day that you really tap into? The other, the other pattern that I've, I've noticed personally, but we also know is true from the research we do, is that it comes from a collision of ideas with others. In other words, it's hard to be really creative by yourself. And when we were studying some of the subjects that, that went into our book we published last year, Leaders, Myth, and Reality, one of the chapters is devoted to thought leadership because it's a book about leadership and we wanted to be very broad. We wanted to cover every type of leadership, political leadership, organizational leadership, thought leadership. And we picked two geniuses, artistic and, and intellectual geniuses, so that we could dive into where does thought leadership come from and so forth. And one of the things you encounter in one of our, our profiles is Albert Einstein is the myth of the lone genius. This idea that Einstein's output came from his brain alone, and that's totally wrong. Yes, he had some flashes of insight, but mostly he built on the work of others. And he wouldn't have gotten to revolutionizing physics if he hadn't been in a dialogue with other physicists. So to get great insight, you, yes, you have to find time to have individual reflection and you have to be bold enough to believe in those ideas, which we should come back to. But you also have to be in a dialogue with others, a genuine dialogue where you're listening to their ideas because it will spark refinements and improvements to your ideas and it will fill gaps. It will provide extensions and so forth. And that was true for Einstein, and I think it's true for all of us. And I think, so whether it's having lunch with somebody, jumping on a call with somebody and just going back and forth, that's a critical part of insight generation. I saw Einstein's, well, you have a few of the books on the bookshelf. So I'm assuming his playing the violin is similar to your running. So with him going out there and, and meeting with other ideas, what else do you do? Because I know you're incredibly thoughtful and very methodical about your approach. So how are you fostering and cultivating these new ideas? First, we should be, we should be very cautious about any sort of comparison between me and Einstein <laughs> because one, I don't play the violin and two, I'm definitely not even uh, anywhere close to being in his league. You know, I, um, I think the other thing you have to do is get outside of your normal echo chamber and listen to people who have outside views, who have ostensibly little authority to be providing you insight on something. You know, and, and going back to our research, it's surprising where really good ideas come from. And one of the recurring patterns there is they come from outsiders who, who have no expertise, very little experience. And because of that, they have better ideas because they aren't biased by 
conventional wisdom. So I think one of the things you can do is go find somebody who, who is the furthest thing from an authority on that thing and ask them what they think. And, and you'll get some, some, and be open to their input and you'll get some new ideas. I'm thinking about the openness to new ideas and, and something I think about, and I'm just wondering how you view this, is strong opinions weakly held. So I'll have a strong opinion on something, but I'm completely open to new ideas. When you're approaching a, a new subject or a new meeting, what are you thinking going into it? And, and I think the one, refine, that's a great phrase, strong opinions weakly held, because it, it signifies the fact that you're aware of what you think, but you're open to changing your mind, right? Um, you're not afraid to say, this is the way I see the world and this is what I think about things, but I'm also open to being proven wrong. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think the, the one, the one, the third thing I would add is speak last, not first, or ask questions rather than make statements because we don't live in a static one dimensional world. And every time you, even if you said, look, I'm going to, have strong views, which I'm going to tell you, but they're weakly held, meaning I'm open to changing my mind. As soon as I tell you what my views are, I put my thumb on the scale of our conversation. And particularly if I'm in a position of authority, so if you're a, a coworker and you see me in some position of authority in our organization, I've really put my thumb on the scale. And most of the people we work with are in that position or in that dilemma where they're a senior leader in their organization. They're trying to create some new output for the organization and they're trying to figure out how to do that and one of the best things to do is stop talking and start listening because now you're getting insights from the people closest to the problems you're trying to solve and their input to you hasn't been biased or deflected by the way you initiated the engagement or the meeting or whatever right so the only way I would refine upon it is the idea of of speak later, not first, and ask questions rather than make statements. Initiate the conversation or the meeting. I have to think back to, to 45 minutes ago. We've never met before. And you might have just done 30 seconds of quick research on myself, but you came loaded with a couple things you knew were at the foremost of my heart. You brought up my young son, so you knew about that. I'm interested what the thinking is behind that. What roadmap do you have coming into this? That's simple. The thing we all have in common, whether you're red or blue, whether you're black or white, whether you're from this continent or that continent, is we're human. And as soon as you find things that you have in common as humans, everything gets better and easier. Right? And... That's true in almost every walk of life. We, and we think about that as former military people, as veterans, pretty often. About how do you, how do you explain veterans who can at once be ready to kill their adversary with lethal force? but then also walk away from the battlefield having respect for their adversaries as humans who are on the other side of some paradigm or narrative. And that happens. And, and one of the famous cases, and we dedicated our book to, to him, among others, but John McCain was a great example of this. He passed last year, but he, he left us with this example of someone who learned to respect people who had been on the other side of them ideologically or politically and so forth. And he, that didn't mean that he was weak. It actually meant that he was strong, but he could, he could, and he, and, and the famous case was when he um, not only forgave his, those who imprisoned him in the Hanoi Hilton during the Vietnam War, the Vietnamese, but he forgave the American protesters who called him a baby killer and protested their activities while he was a prisoner of war. He even forgave them. And we, we thought a lot about that. And anyways, to go back to your initial question, as soon as we see one another as 
as humans, it opens up a lot, right? And it, and it takes away this idea that it's us versus them. It's that it's we. And as soon as it's we, you're on a different level. And for people our age who both have young sons or children, that's a lot in common, right? And, and there's so much, we could talk for hours about having a son and we could find a lot to relate to one another just in that alone. And that is a powerful place to start. I was fortunate enough to be talking with General Stanley McChrystal for about 15 minutes when I first got here. And uh, I asked him, I said, what's, what's one thing that just stood out for him with your relationship? And he just mentioned how thoughtful you are. I'm thinking for myself almost, as I get older, you have new epiphanies, how you, how you view things, how you go about things. How much has your thoughts shifted over the last 15, 20 years? How, how far along are you on, on your overall thought process and how you view things? Probably not as much as it should and probably not as much as I'd like to think. As you said, it's, it's good to have strong opinions that are weakly held, meaning you're ready to, to shift your perspective and be open to new learning. The good, the good news is we're all equipped for that, right? Like one of the greatest scientific advancements in human psychology and neuroscience and so forth is neurogenesis, the idea that there's part of our brain that is always developing new neurons. In other words, it's not too late to learn as an adult to change your mind, to develop um, new talents, new skills, and so forth. And, you know, I, I, I am uh, trying to, to do as much of that as I can to reinvent myself, uh, to, to open myself to new ideas, but I'm probably not as good as, it, as I should be. And, you know, I, I appreciate Stan saying that, but I, I don't, I don't feel like I've been as successful as I'd like, or as productive as I'd like, in terms of of advancing thought, advancing um, our thinking about the work we do, which is organizational performance and so forth. Uh, there's there's still a lot more to be done there. There's a lot more second guessing of our own ideas that we're not doing, that we could be doing. There's a lot more dogma that we need to shed that we're not. And so I actually think, yes, we're thoughtful. Yes, we're thought leaders, but we have a long way to go. It's making me think back to a conversation I was having last week with the thriller writer, Brad Thor, and something he brought up is stagnation is death. And he just he's constantly looking for ways to improve himself so what do you do specifically? You mentioned there are certain times you'll, you'll read new articles. I'm just wondering about your, your skill acquisition. What does that look like? How do you learn something new? The phrase stagnation is death, um, by the way. It, it's a, um, it's a one that resonates to, to military people because there's literally an idea in soldiering, um, about it's called ballooning but it's the idea that you know a balloon in the wind doesn't sit still and it's very hard to shoot and so it's this idea that you should never be stagnant on a battlefield because you're an easier target and it's a very simple idea but it's not a bad one and if you ever see a group of soldiers on patrol not standing still that's ballooning and it's that it's literally the implementation of that idea that that stagnation is death <laughs> So Thor's got a point there. Um, and, and more seriously, we've thought a lot in recent weeks, in fact, um, about how do we reinvent the concept of risk management? And what does it mean to think about our risks differently? And one of the things that, that Stan has got us focused on, Stan McChrystal, is this idea of our bias toward inaction and the need to simply shift to having a bias towards action. In other words, and it may not be the right action. And that's exactly the point and the answer to your question about where do you learn? It's to take action and then observe. That's it. It doesn't matter if the action is right or wrong. Now, there's some exceptions. If you're operating a nuclear power plant, 
yes, make the action on the basis of some formal governance system that's highly regulated and very carefully controlled because it's a nuclear reactor. Otherwise, in most walks of life, the bias to action with the subsequent openness to observation is how you learn. And it literally doesn't matter if you're taking the right action. It, it helps to be informed about the action you're taking, but just take action and then watch what happens and learn and, and iterate on the basis of that learning. And I think that in some ways is the key to learning is to just get yourself in a position where you're unafraid to simply take action and then observe what happens as a result. We, we have this um, program I've been a part of in the past. We run what it's called competitive failing. And the whole idea is to get people to do things that make them deeply uncomfortable that you would never normally do, like go up and ask a stranger to use their cell phone. I don't know. That's a pretty tame example. But and the idea is to do things where you, you expect the answer is going to be no, but you get comfortable with taking that action and then kind of learning on the basis of it and learning a bit about yourself, but also about the world we live in. You mentioned this is, this is something you guys are concentrating on more recently even about taking more action. Why specifically now did you decide that's something you need to focus more on? No, that's a good question. We grew up, most of us, in the 20th century. The 20th century was a wonderful century of scientific advancement and so forth, but it was dominated by a lot of reductionist thinking. It was dominated by a lot of of the quest for predictability. And what that led to was the idea that we should analyze things before we act. Because we can study things, learn things, predict things, and then take the right action and get a predictable result. And that's a wonderfully comfortable way of thinking about the world, and it did dominate most of the 20th century. I think where we are today and what animates a lot of our thinking is that we actually, that's, that's filled with a lot of hubris. And because of the, the nature of the information age and the world we live in, that way of operating doesn't hold as much as it used to. And so instead of doing an exorbitant amount of analysis before we take action, we should take action and then invest in observation and see what we learn about the world we live in from that action. And it's a different way of thinking about it, right? And it isn't, it isn't right for, as I mentioned with the nuclear power plant, it isn't right for all situations, but, but increasingly we think that's the world we live in, in terms of cause and effect, be, in large part because of the nature of the way things are now. Taking more risks, I'm thinking, say it goes wrong, maybe it goes right, how do you assess? Do you do something along the lines of a postmortem to, to understand where critical errors were made, how you can learn from mistakes and even successes? We do. You know, as, as um, many of our, our counterparts and our folks in our industry would do, we do do a lot of debriefing. It, it comes from our military genesis and our military DNA. It's a big part of military operations, obviously, and for good reason, because Every, every execution is surprising and has something to, to learn. I actually think the trick is not in the debriefing or in the postmortem. I think that's fairly straightforward. The trick is in doing something with that. So the, the trick is not in doing the postmortem after the execution. The, the hard part of the loop to close is between the postmortem and then the next execution. Right? Everybody's good about doing the debrief and saying, oh, you know, we should have done this, or I learned that. Right? Everybody's got that down. What very few people have down is they pull all that stuff out before the next execution and go, oh, remember last postmortem we said blank? We need to do blank this time. We're about to do that thing again. That's the part of the loop nobody closes, is, is connecting that, whether it's in your, your knowledge management system or your your business process or whatever, that's the loop of learning that's lost for most of us. And 
it's a hard one to close for real reasons, but I think that's, that's the key. You mentioned being able to, to figure out a constantly evolving and ever-changing world and landscape. That seems to be a framework or a mental model you're using. Are there other frameworks that, that you've structured or models you try to follow? There are. There are. I think the, the, uh, the one that's a little bit more fundamental and a little bit more timeless is just where does human action come from? What motivates us as humans to do the things we do? Because at the end of the day, that's all the day produces is the aggregate sum of what everybody did that day. Like there's nothing else happening in an organization. It's just, yes, there's machines and computers doing work and crunching stuff. But, and, and there's people who do that. But really what we care about is, is what the people do, right? Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's useful to have a framework about what drives people to do what they do. In other words, what's the science of human motivation? What do we know about behavior and behavioral science? And so I think it's important to have a framework there. And, you know, my framework is, is the one that's borrowed from literature and, and the research that's been done, which is essentially that, that most humans act not for extrinsic benefit, right? Because you're going to get a paycheck or because you're going to get some sort of external recognition or reward, but because of what it does on the inside, the sense of fulfillment that it gives you, a sense of learning that it gives you, a sense of belonging, affiliation, and so forth. And I think that's a more important framework to think about because at the end of the day, if you're trying to influence either your own individual output or the output of your organization, it does come down to what is driving human action and where are you going to get more motivation, where are you going to get more creativity, where are you going to get more productivity. Have you seen a shift recently? I just happened to see a bunch of the the past interns for you guys starting their first day of work. And have you seen a shift in the newer, younger employees today in comparison with people 10, 15 years ago? You know, we run into that question all the time. Everybody's asking that question. How do you lead millennials, right? What's different about the next generation? And it's a, it's a real question for obvious reasons. I think my first answer is that the millennials are no different than any other contextual variation in our environment. There are hundreds of ways in which the working environment or professional environment where we're within is dynamic and diverse. And generational differences are just one of them, right? There's, there's gender, there's race, there, there's just a lot of, of dynamic variation and diversity that we need to pay attention to. And, and the millennials are just one example of that. So usually I, I try to remind folks that there's something broader going on here. And it's simply about paying attention to the fact that there is a lot of diversity and you need to be mindful of that, you know, inclusive, of course, but you need to, you need to think that not everybody's wired the same and, and not everybody's going to respond like you do and so forth. Um, now to millennials, particularly, there's a lot of stereotypes. I'm not sure that we've got millennials and the Gen Z and Gen Y and so forth mapped out accurately. I'm not sure all the stereotypes hold the water. I do think one of the things we see is that it, in the stereotype and in reality is that they, they are driven by something on the inside. They're looking for something different than other generations. And it's not that it's not that they're different. I think it's just that they're a little bit closer to what we all have in common as humans, and that is wanting a sense of meaning in our lives, having a sense of being connected to something bigger than ourselves, having a sense of purpose that's pulling us or driving us forward and they're looking for that and they're just a little bit more i think in touch with that very real dynamic of human behavior being driven by a sense of purpose so in a lot of ways that shows up as a negative because either they're seen as switching jobs quite often that's one of the stereotypes but i think what it really comes back to is something we all have in common which is they're just looking to be part of something bigger why that's manifesting in this generation, I think, is a more important question. If that's true, why are we noticing that in this generation 
in a more prominent way than in previous generations? Why didn't it manifest earlier? That, to me, is a much more probing and deeping, deeper issue. And I think it goes back to just the nature of society and the communities we live in now and, and the direction that, that that's headed in, which is, you know, frankly, a longer conversation, but I think it's part of a bigger issue. Has that manifested in yourself throughout your career? It has. I think for, for a lot of us, we, the nature of our friendships changes. You, you, you become a parent and your relationship with your kids takes greater priority and you find that your relationships with your friends doesn't have the same gravity and priority that it used to, which is one of the things that I think parents struggle with, reconciling and so forth. And you do that for transactional reasons, for operational, <laughs> the, you know, real reasons, like your, your kids just need you. Um, and you also do it because, you know, your kids give you a lot of sense of fulfillment, but there's a, there's a shift in all of our lives, I think, that's happening. Um, and then I do think that that you can see over the course of someone that's at my point in life, about my age, that there has been a shift in the way we feel about society, the way we feel about our communities and so forth, and how much of our community and, and social network has gone from being something that's real to something that's digital, for instance. And I think that's an effect that's, that can't be ignored. And many of us have felt that. And I, I don't think a lot of that's healthy, frankly. And that's cert certainly something I've noticed. So someone who's lived through those feelings, those changes, what do you recommend for even someone like myself that when I feel a certain thing going throughout life, anything we can do, help prepare and then help even continue our own journey? Yeah, I think whatever you can do to, to enrich and awake real communities in whatever way that makes sense to you. And it may be literally you think of my neighborhood community, my kids' school community, my church community, my, my, uh, my extracurricular recreational community, my professional community. But, and I say real community as opposed to a curated digital community, which to me is not real because it's digital. I think the digital tools are hopefully just a tool that accelerates the, the participation in real communities. But I would say that's the thing we need to, to find a way to rebalance, is to find real communities with real relationships, with real people in person, <laughs> live, right? And, and, and that's worth, always worth, investment. I'm just thinking, what did you think you were going to be as a kid? A fisherman. Really? I grew up in New Hampshire. Yeah. I, 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 for a long time, I wanted a lobster boat. I thought that was the coolest thing. And then, and then I was, I, and I was a son of an air force officer. So then I became really interested in, in flying, wanted to be a pilot. So for a big chunk of the, the childhood, I was Pretty sure I was going to be like a pilot. What were the next thoughts after you realized maybe that wasn't the path you were going on? Well, I went to the Naval Academy because I wanted to be a pilot. I saw Top Gun. That, by the way, they're making Top Gun too. I don't know if you know that. Um, that's pretty exciting for my generation. We, you know, it's a big deal, and particularly because it, it had such an influence on me. So I had an Air Force officer father. I saw Top Gun, and then I realized I wanted to fly, but I didn't want to fly for the Air Force because that's boring. The runways are, are like a mile long. That's not very interesting. Aircraft carriers are really short and they're moving. That was much more adventurous. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go fly for the Navy. Went to the Naval Academy. And then I also had this sense that my military career had to be about the study of leadership. And I quite literally thought to myself, there is no leadership in the cockpit of a single seat aircraft you are just operating machinery. And that's when I said, wait a second, I can't fly 
and be a leader. And that's about when I discovered the special operations community. And that looked equally adventurous, and, but much more able to scratch the leadership itch for obvious reasons. So that's when I said, okay, I'm giving up on the pilot thing and I'm going to go do this special operations thing instead. And, and here we are. First off, we need to stop and make sure if there's anyone out there who has not seen Top Gun, they must pause this and go watch that right now. Particularly before Top Gun 2 comes out. <laughs> exactly, yes. That's going to be a big deal. I'm thinking about the sense of adventure. And you mentioned the runways were too long. Were you always like that? Always looking for a little thrill? You know, I, I grew up outdoors. I, I grew up uh, in a part of New Hampshire where I had access to the outdoors. And it, and it was a major part of my upbringing. It wasn't hyper adventurous. We didn't we didn't live in, um, you know, we lived in in rural New Hampshire. It, you know, how adventurous could it be? But for me, it was a wilderness, and it was like an acre, right? But it was a wilderness. Like there was a stream, and there was a pond, and there were carp fish and snapping turtles, and wow, it was a huge adventure. And I think I also had the good fortune of my parents letting me explore that really on my own to the point where I'd, you know, uh, put myself in some, some hairy positions. And, and I think that was an important part of growing up. Eventually, I got to the point where I did have a sense that the maritime environment was one of adventure. Like there is... There is something qualitatively different about warfare or life at sea because of the nature of seagoing. And it's, I think it's carried over into the Navy's organizational culture, and it, which is distinct. Every, every military service has its own culture. But I think part of what makes the Navy the Navy and a little bit more risk accepting is its maritime origins, right? And, and it's fairly obvious. And it's, it's just different because being out at sea is necessarily uncertain and, and unforgiving. We're going to jump into that uncertainty and more around leadership in a minute. But tell me if this is true or not. Did you go to college starting to play water polo and then ended up stopping after a week? More or less. I think it was like a month. I thought, yeah, I thought I played in high school and, you know, I wasn't great, but I thought I was good enough to play in college. And it was just a natural, obvious thing to do because Navy had a good water polo program. And yeah, I lasted like a month. (laughs) So was it the the physicality and the difficulty? Yes. It's, I mean, I got a, I got a real appreciation for what collegiate water polo could be. And simply put, I came to water polo not as a competitive swimmer. A lot of water polo players come to the sport as former competitive swimmers. And just to give you an example, I would, would get through the first part of our practices, through the warm-up, which to me was like an entire practice in and of itself because you would, you would do like a 5,000 swim warm-up. And then you would go to water polo practice. And I was like, wait a second. We just did a full workout. Like that like, was a lot. And for most of the people on the team, that felt like a warm-up. For me, it felt like a punishment. It felt like I, I was um, hanging on. And that's about the point I realized I'm, this is not for me. I'm, I'm not cut for this. So I think you probably know where I'm going with this. I'm trying to figure out, and especially for those people out there who, who might have failed at something or just didn't continue with something, trying to find that perseverance. And so then how do you go on to become a Navy SEAL and pass the most hardcore and physically demanding training there is? Good, good question. And I, I had to learn. But, and by the way, you don't have to be a superstar athlete to get through the Navy SEAL training program. It, and that's a common misperception is that it's something about physical performance. And in fact, there's been lots of studies done on who's going to make it through SEAL training or w- who's going to make it um, to be a really top performing special warfare 
um, officer or, or person and so forth, there, there really has been a hard look at that and it defies most expectations. A lot of people would assume that people who are physically fit or come from some sort of professional endurance athlete background are going to do well. And there are a lot of water, polos, water polo players who do well, but that's mostly because they're comfortable in the water in arduous circumstances, right? Because that's essentially the definition of water polo. You got a whole bunch of people trying to kill each other underwater and get a ball on a net. Like that's water polo. The other group that's overrepresented in the SEAL community, maybe not surprising, is wrestlers. And because wrestlers know how to be mentally tough. Just to make weight for a wrestling meet is really tough. Like you have to, and it's crazy what wrestlers do just to get into their, their way off for their weight class in wrestling. But then the, the physical act of training and, and competing in wrestling is itself arduous, not just physically, but mentally. And I think one of the things we know is that it's really more about mental toughness, not physical toughness. And that's a different skill. You can be slow as a swimmer and slow as a runner and mentally tough and make it through training and be really um, successful and, and hugely value added to that community just because of that mental toughness because you never quit. And in my case with the water polo, I actually didn't quit. I got cut. <laughs> so they, they made the decision for me and then I went and found a new sport. Um, but that's really what it's about. It's about the mental toughness to persist no matter what then maybe my question doesn't make enough sense considering that you were, you were cut. So you had a bit of a mental edge there. How do you even harden that mental edge and build toughness in yourself? One of the things we know from the research on this, and there, there is some research on this, not as much as there should be, um, you know, where does grit come from? And grit's a big term now, right? There's best-selling books about it and so forth. But where does that come from? How can you raise it in your children? How can you develop it in yourself? One of the things we know is it is conditioned and learned. In other words, expose yourself to stress. And you will learn that you, you will surprise yourself with what you can tolerate and persevere through. And the more you do that, the more you become resilient to adversity because you start to shake off more and more stuff. You're like, oh yeah, that thing, I encountered that thing and it wasn't as big of a deal as I thought. And you just collect a lot of those, those realizations and you just become grittier or more resilient. So I think the simple, simplest thing you can do is expose yourself to adversity and stress. And, and not too much, right? I mean, you don't want to be ridiculous about it, take lethal risks, but that I think is proven to change the way the, the cognitive wiring works. Do you find a lot of joy in that? You know, that's a funny question. I wouldn't call it joy. There, there, we actually know from physiology, this, you, you know, the runner's high, that euphoria you get when you persevere through something that, that physically is really tough or something. Um, that's, a, that's a real effect. And so I actually love encountering that it's really hard because you have to it's not every day you can go out and kind of expose yourself to that kind of physical um stress but so that that's kind of at one end but i think like everybody want when you're on the other side of something that was changing your your uh your cortisol levels and your your heart rate and so forth when you're on the other side of that and you're looking back on it as something you experienced and not something you're fearing in the moment, it always feels good. I, don't, I wouldn't call it joy. Um, I call it that kind of that, that post-stress glow of being able to relax and being on you know, the other side of that. Because as with anything, you don't really understand relaxation until you understand its opposite, right, of stress. And... It's more of a glow, <laughs> not joy though. What's the most recent memory where you've experienced that glow? I did a three-day endurance race in the Alps a couple weeks ago, a paragliding hike and fly race. And it's meant to be mostly flying, which can be stressful, but it's not physically stressful. It's usually 
mentally stressful because the, the, the conditions in the air can be anxiety producing sometimes. But we had two out of the three days were bad weather. So it actually became more of just a suffer fest on the ground because it was raining and you had to cover the distance basically on foot with a pack on your back through the Alps. And so it, it was like a, you know, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a hiking through the Alps in the rain suffer fest to get to the finish line. And that, that was, that qualified as a, you know, a, a runner's high producing euphoria event. Yeah. You mentioned being up in the air can produce anxiety type moments. What do you do? You're, you're up in the air. You feel one of these. How do you handle that? You know, the funny thing is I, if, if it's not literally like a life and death situation, I usually close my eyes and breathe and I focus on my breathing, which sounds ridiculous. Like, why would you close your eyes? But closing your eyes for me and focusing on my breathing resets some, something inside. And we, I mean, we know that, right? We know that heart rate, heart rate variability is correlated to breathing and so forth. And that, um, it's a, it's a great practice for anybody. And I use it in the air when things get really dicey because what it does is it's actually a way of making myself safer because it restores better um, cognitive process, right? More rational clarity of thinking, um, better judgment and so forth. You're going to make better decisions if you're in that de-escalated state and you can get there through the breathing. So that's typically what I do is I just close my eyes, try to feel what's going on and just think about my breathing. Can you get specific on what the actual breathing practice looks like? Is it a certain count in the nose or, or anything specific or do you just, just breathe naturally? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the usual stuff, uh, nasal square breathing for me. So um, not available to everybody with the same comfort and effect, but you know, square breathing means it's, it's kind of equal parts, inhalation, hold, exhalation, hold, and so forth. Um, and it, it's really that simple. And you, you know, in flight, in a paraglider, you can't do it for minutes, but even just doing it for 10 seconds has a pretty profound effect on relaxing the physiology and getting back to a clearer cognitive state of mind. Is this something you practice or have honed outside of flying to better prepare yourself during those moments? I actually learned that in rock climbing when I used to, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of rock climbing and, and mountaineering and I, I wasn't that good. <laughs> and, and I was usually more adventurous than I was skilled. So I would, I would often find myself putting myself in situations I didn't like, but it, too late. Right. So you, you, it's too late to, and you had to kind of figure it out. You're like, okay, this was really dumb. I wish I wasn't here, but here I am and I need to get out of this. I don't want to die. And that's where I started learning the practice to, to restore calm and functionality. Because very often, the, the most dangerous thing is not the actual state of affairs. It's your mental state, right? It's not your precarious ledge you're standing on that's going to kill you. It's your brain reacting to some perceived threat that's going to kill you. And so if you can control the cognitive state, you control the risk. I'm going to use the word freak out for lack of a better term. <laughs> do you ever freak out? I do. Really? I do. I do. And I, um, you know, I think some of, some amount of that, and I don't want to make excuses. Some amount of that is normal. And what I try to do now is I try to take notice of it and try to make it less recurring. Like one of the things that really freaks me out and this is really embarrassing to admit, I get really annoyed in traffic. I'm at my worst behind the wheel of a car. And for that reason, I try not to drive, particularly in traffic. But it's just, I, there's something about it. And I've, uh, so now I've learned that for whatever reason, one of the times where I can get irritable or at, at my worst is behind the wheel of a car in bad traffic with bad drivers or whatever, and so, you know, I try to find ways to, when I know I'm in a situation where I'm susceptible to that, to do things that, that maybe 
um, prevent those type of freakouts. And you know whether that's you know listening to music or a podcast or just leaving ahead of time so you're relaxed about the schedule or whatever. I have to now. I'm now better able to to ameliorate some of that. Is the key thing just being aware of it and those types of triggers? Yeah, being aware of it, feeling it coming on, um, being willing to uh, be open with yourself that that it's not a good habit, that it's not a good behavior, being open to external reflections that you have a tendency to do that, which most of us don't get enough of, by the way. Most of us shy away from giving that kind of feedback to our friends or our colleagues or our teammates or our partners to their detriment and ours. And it's, it's a, there's a great irony there that one of the best things we can do for each other is one of the hardest things is to give that feedback in a, in a caring way, like lots of great terms for that radical candor and so forth. But, you know, do you love someone enough to tell them the really hard thing they're not going to like to hear? So then what do you do to surround yourself with people that'll give you that feedback? Or how do you get that out of those people that are already surrounding you? One of the, the quickest and, and most obvious things you can do is ask for it and give people permission to give it to you. That will lower some barriers. And just to, to be upfront, hey, I, I'd really love to hear your feedback on how that went and invite it. And very often that will be the thing that makes the difference to someone. Okay, well, in that case... <laughs> Let me tell you what I really think. I think you sucked <laughs> and, and here's why. Uh, and that's feedback you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Let's touch on the leadership epiphany in the cockpit. You realize it seems like at a young age that to get that experience, you, you need to come in contact with more people. How does that idea even come to be? And then once you've realized that, how do you expand upon that? Well, that, that idea came to be just from the simple fact that, and I still, I still think this is true, that leadership for a fighter pilot is fundamentally different than leadership for the platoon leader of a special operations unit. It's just, I think that's fairly obvious. I think where I got it wrong with that initial insight was that I was thinking of leadership, the platoon leader, for instance, as the one who made the decisions, had the right answers, knew what to do, had the judgment. And I had that from wherever I got it. I don't, I don't know how I, I got so misguided. I had that view early in my career that that's what a leader did. And as a practitioner of leadership, much of what I came to believe about leadership was because I fell into that trap early on. And I fell into that trap in a bad way where I made bad calls, bad decisions. I had bad judgment. I didn't have the right answers. And I had to unlearn everything I had thought I knew about leadership, that the right answers are with the junior people, not the leader. That many times the best judgment is sitting somewhere in the team, not with the leader. And that was a difficult process for me personally because it involved, frankly, a lot of mistakes and failure. And because, and and there's some irony here, because I was actually, I think, ineffective as a leader because I was misguided about what leadership is and isn't, I became more interested in being a student and researcher of leadership in this new way of thinking about it, which is and frankly, it's not new. I mean, th- these ideas have been around for decades that, that the leader is somebody who enables the, the um, realization, the, the, the harvesting of all the great judgment that's within the system is not the holder of all that knowledge and judgment themselves. A lot of that is touched on in the book. What do you think is just the most thought-provoking idea that you didn't necessarily have going into the book but after all the research and writing you walked away from with? Yeah, great question because you actually probably without realizing it, I mean, you hit upon one of the most interesting things in the process of writing the book, which was that we didn't know where we were going to end up when we started. All we knew is that there was a lot 
that we think about leadership that's mythology. That's what we started with. And we started with a structural approach. We were going to pair leaders and, and compare them. That was a, a, a structure we borrowed from the Greek biographer, um, Plutarch. But so we started with a structure. We started with this idea that leadership is mostly, mostly mythology. And by that, I mean, we were all as former practitioners walking around with all these, these contradictions. So for instance, because of my experience with leadership, I became a proponent and an advocate for what we call humble leadership or servant leadership, the, the virtue of humility in leadership. And one of the more recurring questions I would get when I was teaching to undergraduates and so forth was if humility is such this respected virtue in leadership, why do you find so many successful leaders who lack humility? And they're right. And now, you know, in hindsight, so then I, I actually started digging into that part of the research. And it's true. Narcissist personality types are overrepresented in senior leader positions. And yet we say humility is good for leadership. So there's something awry there. So we brought all of these, these contradictions, these disconnects, these, mis you know, these misunderstandings to the book. And we wanted to provide a new definition or framing of leadership that somehow reconciled all of that, that somehow gave us a way of making sense of those disconnects. And, but we didn't know what that was going to be. We just knew that's what we wanted the book to do. And and where we emerged was one of the ways to, to approach that reconciliation is first to say that leadership is not a process. It is a system. It's the property of a complex system. It's something that is of the system. It's not something that is in the leader. The leader is just one part of that system. That system includes the followers. That system includes the context. And if you think about leadership as that, it gets you moving in the direction of reconciling some of those disconnects and, and getting dispensing with much of the mythology. Um, and we came to that both by looking hard at all these profiles we did, but also just going back to the beginning of where did leadership come from? Where do you first see it emerge in human civilization and in, in that, that record of history and so forth? Why did it emerge? Why does it persist in the way it persists and so forth? And I think that's the, the biggest single line um, you know, uh, conclusion the book makes is that idea that leadership is not a process, but it is a system. And once you accept that and you accept its implications, you, you are in a better position to be more effective as a leader. Something you were just hitting on that, that I've always battled internally and, and looking amongst some of the great leaders that I've played under, been involved in business with, and then just even read about is the ego. And, and how do we handle that? And it almost seems they, they have those Machiavellian tactics. And, and where's the, the true myth and reality there? So that is one of the big disconnects that needs to be reconciled is so going back to the question of why do you find so many narcissistic personality types emerging as those who lead us and what does that say about us and what does that say about leadership and what's the role of ego we get it with humility why is humility good that's pretty self-evident to most people Humility is good because it means the leaders celebrate the success of others it means they're more welcoming of the, the input of their team, it means they celebrate the knowledge within their team, and so on and so forth. Humility is great. What's the role of ego? That's a harder question. Why do we keep going back to excessively confident leaders who are almost deceptively confident with their promises and so forth? And why is that a good thing? We know why it's a bad thing, but why is it a good thing? And in some ways it's good because, and it's a, a bit of an illusion, um, because the, the challenges we face in life are real. And we look to find hope. And, and where do we find hope? We find it in those among us who appear to have the strength and the courage and the conviction and the answers to get us out of the crises we face. 
in in people with strong senses of ego generally give some perception that they've got that ability um, if they're so disposed right to to step forward and say I will lead us from this mess and and that's one of the ways in which we find ego showing up and actually serving leaders well is because it it it, it gives them something that that followers are looking for in their leaders a sense of direction a sense of vision a sense of salvation from the challenges we all face all the time who doesn't want that who doesn't want somebody who's convincing and compelling to show up and go you know what life is going to be better trust me follow me let's go right and the, the now here's where it gets really weird is you would think oh well in that case shouldn't you have leaders who are hyper intelligent like genius iq leaders and you don't in fact most leaders are only slightly above average intelligence and it goes to that same idea we we really started with is we want to relate to our leaders we want them to be like us we want them to be familiar we want them to be sort of one of us but slightly more confident, slightly smarter, so that they can be the one that's going to help guide us. From there's something very primal about our wiring that looks to that in leaders, and it's 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 uncomfortable to talk about. It's awkward to say, but it's hard to ignore when you're in the business as I am of really just being a student of this thing we call leadership. We're in your gorgeous offices here. When you have an entire team in, what are you doing to get this even more out of the leader? Yeah. So one of the things we do is, well, well there's several things. Um, you know, we started in this industry of executive development or leader development, really with a very skeptical eye to the industry itself. We all have been through leader development courses to varying degrees, and we were mostly unimpressed with them. And most of them are not very good. And the industry got kind of a bad name for a good reason. And so we actually started by saying, what is broken about this industry we're going in and how could we fix it? And how do you actually change real human behavior and make it stick? Which, by the way, if we knew the answer to that question, you know, things would be different. <laughs> Nobody really has, has solved that one. But that's what guided us. We said, what is the essence of real behavior change? And it's not providing a course that's fun and entertaining and enjoyable. No. It's about actually getting people out of their comfort zone, making them try things that they wouldn't normally do, and so on and so forth. And so we, we design programs that are very experiential, very sustained, very relevant to people's day jobs and, and professional contexts and so forth um, that drive a lot of accountability, so a lot of follow-through and, and so forth that, that are measurable so that we actually try to put quantitative and qualitative metrics against how people's leadership behaviors are actually changing. And that's probably the most important thing itself is we focus not on attributes, but on behaviors, right? Because it's one thing to say, oh, go be humble, but that doesn't work. Like saying humility is an attribute of effective leadership doesn't work because you can't, you can't stick a label on it like an attribute or a characteristic, and that's going to make someone effective. What makes them effective is when you teach them the behaviors that we associate with humility. So for instance, professing ignorance. The three most powerful words you can say as a leader, I don't know. So we, we work just on the behaviors. Say, I don't know more. Ask questions more. Like, and so ours is much more behavioral based than attribute based because attributes, they play well on a PowerPoint slide, but they don't work in actually changing anybody's behavior. Well, I don't know how I could possibly close this without diving deeper for hours on so many of the topics we've hit on, but there are just a couple of things I'm very interested in. One being, you've studied some of the best leaders of all time. Who, if we were going to pick up a book or do more research on, do you really admire? They could be dead. They could be alive. Yeah, we, we wrote our book profiling only dead people so that they couldn't take issue with what we said about them. Um, so my, my temptation is to go with... Um, those among us who are um, not still among us. Um, and, and some of them are, are the ones that people can relate to and 
and know a bit about so that their behaviors will resonate. Um, and, you know, the ones that, that practice many of the things we've talked about. So the way Abraham Lincoln was actually inclusive of his rivals, right? And Doris Kearns Goodwin's treatment of that, like team of rivals, encapsulates, I think, one of the most effective things any leader can do is to pull those, those, those opposing views in rather than push them out. And, and Lincoln encapsulates that very well. And, you know, for obvious reasons, being located here in D.C., that's something we can talk to and, and literally go sit on the steps of, of the Lincoln uh, Monument and, and discuss it. Um, but that one's, that one's fairly uh, conventional. You know, going back to um, Einstein, you know, one of the things we found that made him effective as a thought leader, in other words, where, where and how do you change the way people think about something? It's very difficult to do that just by trying, by asserting, we're going to find something truer about the world, assert it, and then get everybody to believe it. Very difficult. One of his practices that I think is good for any leader, not just thought leaders, any leader, was the use of thought experiments. In other words, things that start with a question that have the form, what if blank? One of the gifts we have as humans is our ability to conceive of imaginary futures, that we can project forward in our brains to not what is here in front of us, the visual cortex we're experiencing, but like some imaginary future that doesn't really exist, right? That's a gift we have as humans. And, and it's a gift that has led us to this amazingly developed state of affairs we live in today. But one of the things people often fail to do is leverage that gift. And it's a powerful gift because as soon as you say what could be, what if blank, you unlock so much as a leader, whether it's a thought leader or organizational leader, that it's criminal not to do it. And Einstein's gift to us was not revolutionizing physics. It was the use of the thought experiment, the power of the thought experiment. And that's what, that's what unlocked everything for him. And it's, it's something we all could do more. Just start by asking questions that start with, what if blank? Okay, let's put aside today. Let's put aside reality. Let's put aside what is. Let's talk about what could be, right? It's immensely powerful. I'm not sure there's a better place to end than to engage the listeners and get them thinking that way. It's, it's truly going to resonate with me the rest of the day and my time going forward. The book, Leaders, Myth, and Reality, you have a lot going on here as well, hosting teams. Anywhere you want everyone going to find out more about yourself. Yeah, so uh, the website's obviously a great place to start, uh, mccrystalgroup.com. And, you know, thanks for, for this conversation. This has been great. It, it was a great experience writing the book. Uh, you know, we talked about what, what the book says. Even though we gave away the punchline, people will still find the book interesting. They should still go crack the book because it's got 13 amazingly interesting um, historical biographies in it. And, and truly, um, even knowing where the book ends in redefining leadership, it is fun to pick through those 13 stories at, at your own pace. Um, so I would still recommend it to anybody. Uh, Leaders, Myth, and Reality, you can find it on Amazon or mccrystalgroup.com if, if folks are interested in what we do as a firm. Yeah, we have that all linked up in the show notes and, and some of those leaders, even Disney, Coco, Chanel. So it was a great read. But Jeff, thanks for joining us on What Got You There. No, thank you, Sean. Uh, I really appreciate you having me. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, 
their MCT coat, and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. If you guys enjoyed the smooth sounds of today's episode, then you can thank Brian Lapries, our sound engineer. And if you enjoy the intro song, check out Justin Great, the man behind it. I can't thank you guys enough for listening. Looking forward to you tuning in next time. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you?